I think back to some of the football games I went to in college. I have a hundred in the mail in a boot or something. <laughs> I don't know if it was the first whiskey I tried, but it's, it's been about the last. I was around the distillery as a kid. My grandfather was the master distiller here for many years. He retired when I was about eight years old. So when I was four, five, six years old, a lot of times I was up here with him, running around and trying to catch the ducks up at the cave spring or playing on the fire engines and things like that. But Jack Daniels was always a place that was interesting. It was more interesting because I got to spend time with my grandfather here. And he's still around, he's, he's 88. And to be able to call him up and have 30 plus years of distilling experience a phone call away is pretty invaluable. Dad worked here over 40 years. Once I got down here and got to work here for probably 10 or 11 years, I got the opportunity to work with my dad. He sort of showed me the ropes of things that he had learned over the past 35 or 40 years, which was pretty neat. My grandmother worked there in uh, no through the 80s, and my dad worked here for uh, 35 years. My dad also was a uh, preacher, so he was a preacher for 35 years. If someone called the house and they asked for Tinky, that was his nickname here, you knew it was a, a Jack Daniel work call. And if they called for Brother Wayne, they were looking for uh, the preacher. Most of the master distillers before me grew up in this area, in the shadows of the distillery, were either related to Jack or, you know, grew up in this community. and. I didn't, but I got here, you know, about as quickly as I could. When you come to Lynchburg, you kind of get a sense it's a singular focused town. It's like we are a whiskey making town and that's what it is and that's what we do. When I came to Jack Daniels, I, I didn't necessarily set my sights on being the next master distiller. I didn't know that if that would even be a possibility for me. But I just looked at what is the next logical thing in front of me and I'll work towards it. You know, Jeff, he's just so approachable. Uh, his door is, is literally always open, and he, there's really no formality with him. If you have an idea or a thought or a problem, you can just walk in in the morning with a cup of coffee and bounce it off of him, and, and you'll get an, an honest opinion back. That's pretty refreshing. Uh, I don't know that everybody gets so lucky to, to have a boss um, to where you really could feel like you can stroll in in any moment very casually and have any, any conversation needed. We've got barrels moving in the 114, hopefully tomorrow. Yep. So I'll go see how many we have and what lot, and then see. Okay, are we, gonna, are we gonna be able to get two lots in there? We will, but it'll be a few weeks before the second lot will be available. Because okay. it'll have to be. How to do be they feel about three lot. lots? I know that's. I don't think it was their favorite, <laughs> but I think they're coming around to the idea. Okay. I grew up in Jackson. Uh, my mother was a school teacher. My father was a railroad worker. I went away to college thinking I would work in the automotive field. I, I think from the time I got a set of keys when I was 16, I was kind of in love and I still love cars. But when I got out of college, it, it was a terrible time to be looking for work in the automotive industry. I lived in Slidell, Louisiana, made coffee for about four and a half years. That was where I was first exposed to the sensory sciences. After a couple of years in Texas, I had an opportunity to come back to Tennessee. And I knew when I got back to Tennessee that I didn't want to leave again. I was going to do the best I could, but to stay close to home. It's where my family is, and uh, it's always been home, even when I was in another state. Jordan Ennis, 
is going to come here tomorrow. Uh, this is for ALS. His father, you know, Steve Dennis, passed away with, with ALS. I did not know that. Okay, we he's going to pick up a barrel head. I don't, a barrel head that uh, Kevin has custom done for him, but also needs a, a branded barrel. Okay. And I don't know, is it best to pick it up here or do you want him to go to Craig Street? No, I can get it here. Get it here? Mm -hmm. All right, when I get the barrel head, it's supposed to be at the, the guard shack later today. I'm going to sign it and just bring it here, that and I'll send, I'll send him here tomorrow. Okay. So on the, on the barrel, is that a finished branded barrel? Or yeah, it's our typical, finished, our typical donation right. barrel, okay. um, which I've just signed about eight of them All right. over at Craig Street, so they should be sitting on some. That's why I was saying I can send him there if you prefer. No, his will be fine. All right, let's do that then. That'll work. Very good. I knew from the first day that I interviewed here, I came and spent a few hours that I was like, I so hope. I mean, I was fingers crossed. I knew there would be stiff competition for the job, uh, but they needed a quality control manager. And uh, I had a, enough quality in my background with enough well-known brands that they felt confident in me that I could do it. And uh, so that's where I started. And that was 16 years ago. It's become the best decision of my life. Well, when I first got here, Jack Daniels was, I would have described it, kind of sleepy. Brown spirits, whiskeys, were very popular through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They began to cool off a little bit in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Vodka kind of became preferred drink in the category that was most growing. Jack Daniels really kind of bucked the trend through that three-decade period. We, we were growing when really very few were. You know, Jack Daniels is an iconic American brand. In an industry where there is a lot of smoke and mirrors, I'd be the first to tell you that not every brand is really who they project themselves to be. Jack Daniels is. It makes it easy for me to stand up on a stage and look people in the eye and talk about who we are. I would struggle to do that with, with other brands in our industry today. It's in this really interesting space to me. It's a very accessible thing. You know, it's Jack, but it's also a high quality product. And usually a very high quality product is not accessible. It's elitist. And Jack Daniels is like the best for every man or woman. And that's a rare space uh, to hold. For Jack Daniels, we have not necessarily been some brand that's been known to put out a lot of little things in small quantities. That was not who we were. That was really not what people wanted from us, it seemed. They wanted consistency. They wanted to know that they could go in any bar in the world and find a bottle of Jack Daniels and it'd be the same. To me, that is what has defined our craft. Yeast is one of the things in whiskey making that often doesn't get talked about these days because very few people have proprietary cultures. Only your oldest whiskey distillers uh, would do what we do and have a culture that's been harvested and, and been kept over years and you know generations. We can date this one back to Prohibition. It was kept as a, a big, uh, very diverse um, jug yeast. Uh, over the years, we have gone through and selected out of it and gotten rid of all the sort of noise in it to, to purify the culture. Uh, but now it's all about maintaining it, making sure that it stays clean. That's you know Kevin's primary focus is making sure that we have a healthy yeast culture because this will ultimately protect our character. When people ask me, well, how do you know that Jack Daniels today tastes like what it did 10 or 20 years ago, and how do you know it's going to taste the same 10 or 20 years from now, uh, one of the main things that would change us is this. 
that's why we're so protective of it. But this is pretty important. And uh, like I said, Kevin's the best. <laughs> Thanks. The success that we've had has enabled us to reinvest into our process and still make whiskey the same way that my grandfather made it in 1957. You know, charcoal mellow, 10 feet of charcoal, the same yeast strain, you know, the, the same care of making our own barrels, you know, all of these things that are really unmatched in the industry. Uh, there's, there's really nobody else controlling the quality of their whiskey the way we control the quality of our whiskey, and that's known. Old number seven better taste the same as it did when my grandfather was making it, right? Because if not, I'll find out about it if I go visit him. <laughs>
you go back in our history, prior to Prohibition, the primary form of American whiskey was rye whiskey. I call it frontier whiskey. It had different attributes. It was a little bit more rough and ragged, if you will. Now, a lot of that has to do with the pepper and spice that kind of follows rye. Throw it back and clench your teeth and hang on and swallow it. And if you got a snake bite, you could clean it with it. It was, it was sort of that style of whiskey. So if you think of it kind of like cooking and you cook a dish and you put way too much pepper in the dish and it tastes like pepper. That's kind of the way we, we approach dry whiskey. Our, our grain bill is 70% rye, 12% malted barley, and 18% corn. So we have a lot of rye character there at 70%, but not overwhelmingly so. There's still some of those natural sweet tones that people know Jack Daniels to be. We wanted to create something that really stood out and made a statement with the spicy, earthy, pungent flavors of rye, but to also balance that with the traditional notes of Jack Daniels have that nod to the past and in our heritage and our tradition of whiskey making here. We're not first uh, into the rye category for sure, but it gave us a chance to think through who we wanted to be when we got there. It gave us some time to plan and think long and hard about it, and I think we've, we've come up with the right decision. I think there's something familiar about it. It's made by us at the distillery in Lynchburg. It has the same yeast culture. It has the same barrel behind it. So I think there's some things that are maybe some commonalities that you would define in the product, but the character is so different that I think for a lot of people who are not necessarily Jack Daniels fans, we're hoping that we can change their minds. That's always you know, what you hope to get when you put out any new product is that you cast a bigger net, that you become appealing to a larger group of people. You know, We've done honey, we've done fire, we've done single barrel, we've done gentleman jack. So this is just one more uh, opportunity for us to find a, a product that will ring people's bell, hopefully, and, and taste like what they want it to taste like. I'm nowhere near as nervous. Uh, about the rye launch as I was about the honey. This really kind of speaks to hardcore craftsmanship uh, and, and the art. You know, it's charcoal mellowed, it's made by us. Only the finest grains coming from a barrel we've manufactured, so all these things are in our favor when it comes to knowing that we can count on the quality of the product. Jack Daniels Tennessee rye, it is significant. We've been on the same grain bill for generations a predominantly corn, a Tennessee whiskey. That's what Jack Daniels is known for around the world, and that's what they continue to make. And so for many years, the strength of a master distiller was, don't mess that up. Continue to make this high quality product in the way that it's always been made. Well, Jack Daniels Tennessee rye allows the distillers to show people or remind them uh, people may have forgotten what a great product Jack Daniels already is, but Jack Daniels Tennessee Rye gives the distillers an opportunity to show their talents once again and for people to have a renewed appreciation of what Jack Daniels has been doing for many, many years. All right, has every, everybody got a glass in their hand of it that wants one? Kind of know, knows this one right quick. You know, to me, there's something familiar about this, even though the flavor is going to be very different. There's something familiar about this rye. Maybe it's the, the yeast culture, or maybe it's the fact that it's coming from the same barrel that we've handcrafted for, for ourselves for years now, for decades. We've been making barrels. Maybe the fact that that's common on this, that really all we're changing here is the grain bill. Kind of, there's something about it that says, hey, I think this is Jack Daniels, even though it's going to be different. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoy it. Where I describe this as being sweet to oaky on that first glass, sweets on the tip of the tongue, oaks in the back of the throat. Notice this one has a lot of mid-palate character and it tends to be very peppery and spicy in character. A lot of in-mouth flavor. So hope you guys enjoy it. Jack Daniels, Tennessee Rye. Nice. Thank you guys for coming. Like I said, the numbers were good when I got here. So I, I don't take credit for how great Jack Daniels was when I got here, but I haven't screwed it up which is good, none of us have screwed it up, and nobody wants to be a part of the generation that would have screwed it up. It's not just about a job for your lifetime, it's about stewardship. You know, this is a job that you hope to pass down to the next generation, whether it be your children or nieces and nephews. He doesn't consider this a job. This is basically our life, and that's his life, that's the way I feel, and that's the way, you know, a lot of people that work at Jack Daniels, it's more than a job. It's, it's something a lot bigger than the individual, and I think Jeff realizes that. You know, Jack is no longer here. He founded the brand, he had those principles, but I think it's just as alive today as it was 
when he passed away in 1911. There's a, a saying on the wall when you go to Jack's old office, it says, every day you make it, make it the best you can. And I think some people look at that as, as sort of a statement that you don't need to change anything. Don't, don't compromise what we have set out to do here. Um, that's kind of implied in that. But if you can make it better tomorrow, you should try. Each new generation has adopted the pride and the mission that every day you make it, make it the best you can. You don't compromise, you don't mess it up. Probably it takes uh, as long as to drink two Bloody Marys to <laughs> by the time the eggs are done. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Oh, hell, That's honey. way more than you need. It was just a family business. It's where my father worked, where my uncle Francis and my uncle Leslie worked, where my male cousins worked when they were old enough to hold a job. It was just always there. Where else can you buy an item for 20 bucks that can cook anything and everything and last a lifetime? Some are old, some are new. What's your favorite piece in here? Oh, I don't know. I cook with this one. I cook with that one on the other room. I don't really have a favorite piece. I just have pieces. I like this hammered one because it's unique. But all of these I just, I bought, I got into the buying mode. Joseph Lodge was born in 1848 in eastern Pennsylvania. Joseph Lodge married Anna Elizabeth Harvey in 1877. They had two children, Richard Leslie Lodge, born in 1883. His older sister was Edith Harvey Lodge. She married Charles Richard Kellerman in 1908. Now, Richard Leslie married Aunt Betty in England, and they had two children, twins, John and Beth. John grew up to be an Episcopal priest. He had four children, one of whom is Henry Lodge, who's working at Lodge today as CEO. There were other brands making cast iron at the turn of the century, and there were other brands that were selling it, but Lodge was consistent, and, and they kept making it, uh, and they didn't stop making it. It starts at the foundry and with the family, and it starts in town, and it really emanates from there. 
And I think if you talk to home cooks and if you talk to professional cooks, they feel the same love for Lodge. We're not your grandmother's Cracker Barrel, but we are, because there's something very powerful about that, that you are um, so rooted in tradition, but yet you are still moving forward. Lodge is that way as well. They're rooted in tradition. They have that quality that's been around, and you know you can trust it, and the future generations are discovering it. When you were, uh, ran the Olympic torch, do you remember in Memphis? Yeah, when uh, Lodge was did the logo skillet for the uh, 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake City. Right, right. We were the first cookware to be licensed, uh, you know. Right, and they ask you ask you to run the torch. And my favorite part, of course, is I was saying you've got to practice. This thing is heavy, so I made you run up and down the road with a skillet in your hand. Yeah. So you could practice holding that weight. With an eight-inch skillet to weigh yeah. three pounds the weight <laughs> of the torch. I had spent my childhood years down at the foundry on Saturday mornings. Uh, we would go down to the office uh, with my father and watch Sky King and uh, black and white TV and get coaxed for a nickel. And I uh, worked during, in the summers at the foundry loading trucks. That's back before we even put skillets in a box. We uh, ran a piece of wire down through the handle and threw them on the truck. So I wanted to build our brand back since my early 20s. But the best thing to ever happen was uh, marrying uh, Cheryl, my wife. And that was before we seasoned anything. And they would season all those skillets before they left the store, which I thought was pretty amazing. Make sure their customers knew what they were doing. As trends changed and as people started looking to aluminum and looking to stainless steel, you know, I think one of the things that's been great about Lodge is that they've just been consistent and now there's a whole cast iron craze happening and, and you know, they're building new foundries to support the business. But I think it speaks to their steadiness uh, and the durability of their product that uh, they never went away. If you treat people well, they will also treat you well. And I find that to be the case at Lodge Cast Iron. Goodness knows we have our days. <laughs> But we act with, I think we try to be fair and, and act with integrity all the time. I got a call from the, my cousin, Dick Kellerman, the foundry and he said, uh, we just fired our shipping clerk. You know how to do that job. Get your, you know what, down here. And I said, okay, I'm coming, but I'm not staying. We used three raw materials in the process. Iron, steel, pig iron. I don't think the company was ever about making money per se. I think we've been about, and hope we still are about, providing a good, honest, steady job to the people in this area and helping to support three, 400 families at any one time over the years. I guess it was really late high school or even college uh, when I kind of started putting the pieces together that uh, had been in the family for, you know, since 1896. Uh, and it was a big part of what the family was all about. In 1965, Dick Kellerman determined to start automating the foundry and put in uh, diesel which had been invented in Switzerland. And you know the history of the somatic is they made machine guns during World War II and after the war they had to find something else to do. And so they developed the disomatic molding machine, pouring machine, and my father heard about it. He and my brother went up to Milwaukee to see the second one in the world and they decided to buy one. Transfer label, we're about to get a good show here. Well, 
Well, in, in the foundry industry, whenever you're transferring iron from one place to another, pouring it in molds, you get a little reaction that creates all these kind of sparks. In the foundry industry, at least when I came here, what I learned was they're called yellow jackets. This is a hammered finish. This is a unique skillet that Bob may be bringing back into production. You can see the finish there. Here's one that doesn't have a name on it, made by the Hunter molding equipment. This one has a Y for the molder mark. This one we can't see the molder's mark on. This is a good place you can kind of look inside the machine and see uh, how it works. What happens when it makes a mold, there's a piston that goes in and out of the machine. And on, on that piston is mounted one side of the pattern. And there's also what we call a sink plate that drops down and closes. Uh, and it's got the other side of the pattern on it. Sand is blown down from above into that cavity and then compressed very hard. These machines can make about 400, well, between 380 and 400 molds per hour. And this is Bubba's kingdom. He's in control. We put iron in this auto pour, and uh, it fills it up, and then we want to pour the iron out. We apply air pressure, and the iron goes out into the pouring trough. When that mold gets in the right position, then the auto pour will automatically let iron slow down into the mold. But if anything needs to be adjusted, Bubba will take care of it. Thank you, Bubba. But again, getting back to the family issue, when my cousin Dick Kellerman was one of the three Kellerman brothers running the business at that time, when he called and said, you know how to do this, we need you, I couldn't say no. I mean, I just, I'm not, I couldn't do that. It's family, it's a business. Uh, but I talked to Dick Kellerman and, and also his brother, Leslie, who was one of the other three brothers, and I told, I remember Leslie particularly said, okay, so here's the way we understand it. We don't have to keep you, you don't have to stay. I said, that sounds like a deal. The piston that was going in and out of the machine, this heavier part would be on that, and this would be on the swing plate we looked at, and it would, it would come down and close the mold. I guess just over a pretty short period, I fell in love with what I was doing. I fell in love with the people I was doing it with and with the company as a whole, and I felt a tie to it, and never really seriously considered anything else after, after a few months of that. It was the right thing to do at the time, you know, and you do what you have to do. And I, you know, once I embraced it, I said, I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna grow this business. And uh, so it's, it's happened and it's made me very happy. So now we've arrived at the uh, finishing area. First step is cleaning the cast and getting you that baked on sand off. So we've got, we've got three cleaning systems, three cleaning lines. So the fellows up here went on, are on what we call the sorting conveyor. So they know at their particular station what castings come off and run down that cleaning line. Anybody in the production line can pull a piece off, off the line if they think there's a flaw in it. It may be a blemish as so small as a pinhead in the surface of the skillet. It's the Joe Lodge legacy. You do a good job at what you're doing. It does, looking back, seem like somewhat of an overnight success. What I've always heard about success is it's when preparation meets opportunity, and we were prepared.
When I first came here in 2001, you sort of wanted to play down the fact that you were from the South. It wasn't cool. Somewhere along the way, the, um, that has changed. And it changed in the, I'm guessing, 2007, 8, and 9, somewhere around in there. The family has always, as owners, has always been very willing to let us reinvest our income and our profits in, back in the company. You've got to have expensive equipment. You've just, there's just a lot of, of capital that needs to be continually reinvested in the company. Authenticity of the South, it resonates. I think a bunch of chefs have come out of the South, done lots of exciting things with Southern cuisine all over the country. And now it is probably the most sought after kind of chef food around. It's just all of a sudden become way cool. We had realized that the, one of the big disadvantages as, as we went through generations and generational changes is that the younger folks coming on didn't understand seasoning. What, what was this seasoning thing? Salt, pepper, what kind of seasoning did you use? Whereas my parents' generation, particularly in the South, I mean, that was the, where cast iron had its biggest strength. But they got all that. We realized that if we could season our product before we put it in a box, it would be a huge, huge advantage, not necessarily a competitive advantage, but, but people would not have to worry about, well, I don't, I, I don't want to buy cast iron because i got to do this stuff to it. We were not prepared for how fast we grew. We were prepared for the market to embrace us did in a much bigger way than we expected. Almost all the media wanted to tell the story of here's this cast iron cookware company in Tennessee that's been making cookware for 120 years and, and now they've revolutionized cast iron and they've made it much easier for you. After that, we also started joining all the chef organizations and making friends with chefs and making sure the culinary programs in the country had cast iron so they could find out about cast iron if they didn't know about it. Yeah, if you go to any restaurant anywhere and they've got a piece of cast iron that has the teardrop handle, not like this one, you immediately want to pick it up and look to see what's on the bottom. Does it say Lodge or is it somebody else? <laughs> We've done that in Venezuela and in Alaska. With Bob running sales and marketing, and me running operations, over the years it went back and forth. Bob, we've got plenty of production. Get your butt busy and get us some sales. And he'd do that to the point where he'd go, OK, Henry, we've got more sales than we can produce. Get me some production. So Bob, and we the, the burden is back on you now. <laughs> about the tens of thousands of hours that have gone into, you know, the manpower, the brain power, the technology out here in the new foundry. Oh, it's just yeah. uh, yeah. mind boggling. Never entered my mind that in, in our lifetimes we would be able to build a greenfield foundry. I know. And, uh, it gives me goosebumps every time I'm out there. <laughs> 
and then to see it actually go up and now today seeing it in production it's yeah. uh, it doesn't get much better than this no it doesn't what changes uh, new equipment more capacity better packaging I came in 2001. It was sort of my job to try and make cast iron hip again. And so 16 years later, I, I think we did. <laughs> now if we can just keep it there. <laughs> I think we're gonna grow. Uh, I think we've had a really sharp, sharp increase in the last few years. Don't expect that to continue, um, but I think Cast Iron has been around for a lot of years. It's getting so popular, there are a lot of competitors out there. But again, if we focus on how do we make sure we can take care of our employees with solutions that are, work in the marketplace, we'll find things we don't even know about today that are gonna help keep our company going. Just keeps getting bigger and better, you know? Cast iron is like women and whiskey. It gets better with age and the company as well. So it's uh, been a long ride. If Joe Lodge came back today, he would have one of two reactions. Wow, I never imagined that the little company I started would grow into this. And, and he would be excited and pleased or he'd come back and he'd say, what have you done to my nice little company? What have you done to it? It's huge, it's taking over, to, it's doing all these. So I hope it would be the, the former, not the latter. I think he'd be pleased. To deal with people that you trust and that you know come to the table every day with a really good business and fair business sense is an honor. This piece of art that the artist may have spent years writing and creating and recording and producing to be able to be sort of a critical part in this chain of delivering this thing. And then they hand it to you and say, all right, it's up to you to do this right, to deliver it to the world. It's a huge responsibility. It's a huge privilege. We all feel very fortunate, every one of us, that we, you know, that's what we get to do every day.
when you walk in there to know that they did the, the first Beatles records on VJ, all the Motown records, the Elvis. Just the feel of that place alone, and since they've been doing it consistently for so long, they know what they're doing. They have that history and all that experience that some of the other companies don't quite have. United Record Pressing is kind of a, a unique company in the music industry, in the vinyl record manufacturing industry, too. On the one hand, we have this wonderful history. The company was founded in 1949. We're the second oldest manufacturer of vinyl records in North America, manufactured in this historic building and on Chestnut Street from 1962 and, until the end of last year, and, and now in, into its new facility. It, it pressed the majority of the Motown records uh, in the 60s and the 70s. It pressed the first uh, Beatles single in America. It, there's a litany of just really, really important music that, that the company has pressed. The State of United uh, Record Pressing, when I first acquired, was this company with a wonderful history located in this beautiful, important building in, in Nashville, Tennessee, but in an in industry that was still in decline. At that time, vinyl records were primarily manufactured for the distribution of 12-inch singles to club DJs around the world. And that was a practice that was sort of slowly dying. They were all promotional records, and so the record companies were giving away tens of thousands of records to DJs. And at the time, in, in 07, 08, record companies were not in a strong financial position, and they sort of recognized that giving away free records is probably not the best way to preserve our financial viability. And we really understood what the business strategy of the company at the time and the way it had operationally built itself. There was a disconnect between where it was and where it needed to go. As you saw kind of the flicker of commercial vinyl and important records being released on vinyl, you recognized that we needed to do some things differently to, to really change how the, uh, how the company delivered its product to the world. United was very focused on making a lot of records fast. Quality wasn't the highest priority. My emotional connection to music, uh, as well as just my orientation to life in general, is I really care about quality. And certainly I care about quality if I'm going to listen to a record and, and understanding what's gone into it. And if I'm going to play a part in delivering that, it's got to be good. We ended up really giving the company a complete operational overhaul and really turning everything upside down and, and trying to understand what is it we're doing today, what is it we can do differently to, to make a higher quality record. And we really reinvented the company operationally. From the kind of vinyl compound we sourced to the brightness of the lights above the inspectors so that we could better reveal flaws, different capital equipment, different technical processes. So right now we're standing in our mechanical room and this is really the engine that powers the plant that lets our presses run and lets us make records. And you have a couple of different processes. Uh, the first is you, you need to bring heat to the presses, steam heat, so you can melt the vinyl compound and get it soft enough to make a record. And to do that, we have our two boilers here that are producing steam heat, feeding it to the boilers, to the extruders, to the dies that allow us to mold the records and make that. So they're delivering steam heat uh, down to the presses and, 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 and making soft vinyl to make records. When you make that heated up vinyl and you press it into a record, eventually you have to cool it off so that, that the, when the press releases, the record will keep its form and, and release. And the way you do that is with water. It's a, it's a closed loop system, and, and it's, it's essential to make the record. Having gone through a few years of transition and reinvention, 08, 09, 2010 timeframe, left us in a position of, of being much stronger, a much higher quality producer, a much more reliable producer than, than we were when I bought the company. It's so manual through the whole time that just in the vinyl manufacturing alone, you'll probably have a good 20 people, probably easy, that touch, physically touch your vinyl until it hits the shelves. And that's just the manufacturing side. It's not even the 
recording side of things and the distribution side of things and the label side of things. And I really think it is amazing. We employ 150 people, and so there's an enormous number of steps, and you're doing it on, on assets and with processes that have been around for a long, long time. I get it. The artist, there's always an element of trust that is going to be involved, uh, especially when you're trying to combine the great forces of art and commerce together. When you go tour that facility at United, it's, it's immediately apparent how much these people care about music. I mean, just the quality control. This dude is, is sitting in this room listening to every sixth record that gets pressed on the machine to make sure that it's right. At some point, you probably spend some amount of time like wondering if what you're doing is like worth being put on something. And so to be able to sit there and hold it in your hands and, and you know, see that, that you know, somebody felt like it was is a pretty humbling experience, to say the least. For a long time, we were rationing our output, and for a long time, we couldn't accept new customers. It, it was a position where we were disappointing a lot of people. We were disappointing our, our, our major label customers because they couldn't get what they needed. Essentially, I had to shut the door to kind of smaller independent artists because we were just too afraid that all we were going to do is disappoint them. We had wait times were you know, nine months to a year, and that, that's crazy. In an age where people are used to sort of, you know, kind of immediate gratification and to tell them they can't have their record for nine months to a year is, is just, it's an awful place to be. If we wanted to continue to be the kind of important partner to our customers that we had been and that we wanted to continue to be, we needed to operate in a, in a new facility. I, you know, the, the whole plant was an empty box. So it used to just be a warehouse. There was nothing in it. And so as you walk through the plant, you see the trenches cut in the floor. You see all the overhead supports to, to support the steam and the water. All the trenches are to support the water lines, cold water and hot water. All of that had to be engineered, designed, built, and installed. Uh, similarly, this was an open courtyard. There was no roof. There was no nothing. And so again, we had to design that to accommodate two large boilers, to accommodate the water circulation, uh, to, com uh, to accommodate the compressed air that you need to, to manage the pneumatics, to grab record labels and all that. So completely from scratch, uh, a clean palette, and today we have this. It's an expansion that sort of when fully executed should allow us to grow our capacity by a factor of about two and a half. We should have the ability to, to make close to 100,000 records a day eventually, and that's an awful lot of records. People visit our plant and see what we're setting out to do and they've, they've reflected on the large plants that were owned by the major labels in the 60s and the 70s, and they've, we've heard stories of the scale of what these things were and how they were. You can see the, the light in their eyes as they, they remember those plants and they see that, well, here's another one come, evolving. As I was sort of searching for this company that I felt I would have a connection to and a, a passion for, I was looking at businesses all over the country and, and looking for sort of a niche business where I felt my involvement in it, my investment in it could make a difference. And in this process, I came across United Record Pressing located in Nashville, Tennessee. I, I don't think I'd ever been to Nashville prior to, to meeting United Record Pressing. Immediately came down and, and experienced this building and, and the, the, the process of making records and, and, and just saw what was here and, and fell in love with the business. But. In the process, I, I, I've, I've really come to, to love Tennessee. I love Nashville. I think there's definitely a synergy in the music economy and the musical environment in Nashville. You have producers, you have engineers, you certainly have artists, you have session musicians. You have Bonnaroo that takes place every summer that draws you know, you know, artists from all over the world, and they all come through Nashville on their way to Bonnaroo. Oh, I'm working at big machine label group and we're in just houses on music row all working together and I feel that really sums up the energy and the mentality of Nashville of it is big business but it's still important and 
the personal relationships matter and the, the sense of community is very important to Nashville. I've been coming to Tennessee since I was 18 years old to make music. This is such a special place in the United States. It's such a special place in the American South. When you examine it from Mountain City to Memphis, um, I can't think of a, of a U.S. state that has more musical significance than ours. The many branches of the tree of American popular music, practically every branch draws some sort of, uh, some sort of tap water from our state. So being here and being, uh, like Pete Seeger says, a link in the chain, it's really exciting to be able to add on to the very essence of American popular music. This is the place where it, where it happened. But I think that Tennessee is the heart and soul of American popular music. One of the really great things that we did in terms of just emotionally great things is we started a recording series, recording up here in the Motown Suite above United Record Pressing. The Motown Suite was built when this building was built, and it was built with a particular purpose in mind. At the time, United was doing a lot of work pressing the records for Motown, being that it was located in Nashville in the segregated South. A lot of the Motown artists and executives were precluded from getting hotel rooms. They wanted to come down, they wanted to see their records made, they wanted to be able to celebrate the release of their records. And so when this plant was built, it was built specifically to be able to accommodate and support those artists. We're here in, in the, the Motown suite in the record release room. One of the things that we've done here is that it was really one of the emotionally most satisfying, energizing things is we, we invited artists to come up here and record. And we worked with a local sound engineer who, who records on, you know, only on analog tape and you know, quarter inch two track tape. And, and we put all the musicians in the room and, and they could configure it in whatever way they wanted to. And, and they, they would record songs and we would record maybe 20, 25 minutes of music. Uh, we'd record a track and, and uh, they'd listen to it. And if they liked it, they'd say, good. And then you go on. If not, they'd rewind the tape and record over it. So there was no edits, no overdubs. It was a very kind of real, you're, you're, you're out there skating on the ice and, and you're going to get what you're going to get. Some artists could do it in four hours and some would take 14 or more and some would do it with a cup of coffee and some would do it with a case of wine. But we, we really created some really, really beautiful records in the process. The space is all intact. We have the brown paneling. We have the nicotine stains on the ceiling. We have the Naga hide furniture. We have turntables from the 60s and the 70s. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to speculate what went on here, and, and it undoubtedly was great. The record keeping of, of who's been here is, is a little sparse, but it's a roster of, of, of every great Motown artist you, you'd want to imagine. Every artist that came in, they just said all of this space just spoke to them with, with an incredible energy and the history and, and, you know, the engineers said the sonic qualities of this room. You know, this was a room that was primarily meant to just have a party so artists could celebrate their art, their, the release of their records. And there was one artist in particular, a, 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 an artist named Corey Chisel. Corey was really excited about it and he was thinking about what he was going to record and it was going to be a combination of original songs and some, some really beautiful covers. And they hadn't been able to finish it so it, it, it was a song without an ending and he kind of showed up early and, and and he said everybody just hold for a while and Adriel come on and they they went in the in the back room back about 90 minutes later they came out and they said we got it we got it and they completed this song and it's a gorgeous song and and we recorded it on the record put on the tape and, and they just it had this amazing amazing power to it and he said you know that day was one of the most memorable powerful days and and you know in in, in his you know professional career. Their energy is in these walls, and we feel so lucky that nobody ever did anything to disturb this, because it's all exactly as it is, including the uh, copies of Billboard magazine from you know, 1971. It's all here, and, and um, you know, we're not going to touch it. Here you have the, uh, you know, the, the newspaper clipping of the, the opening of the plant in 1962. And then ups and down, years for records, and Motown's magic tuned in. 
50 years of 45s. The early history of the company, they only made 45s. United acquired Dixie Record Pressing, and Dixie made 12-inch records. And so with the acquisition of Dick Dixie came 12-inch records. And now that's, that's the predominant format that we press. We still make 45s, but not nearly as many as, the, as we do of the 12-inch records. Music has always been really important to me. Again, growing up in the 70s, my, my mother was passionate about music. At an illegally young age, she would take me to blues bars and, and we would see uh, Muddy Waters and Sun Seals and Corky Siegel and Duke Tomato. And uh, I can remember at you know, age 13, 14, uh, seeing this music and just, it just spoke to me. I mean, everybody in the 70s loved music, but for me, it just, it, it struck a deeper chord. It was really, really in my soul. And, uh, it had always been that way. Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, is my all-time favorite record. It, uh, to me, it just, th there is no more beautiful music. I, I, I like all kinds of music. I love blues, I like rock, and you know, indie, uh, but, but that particular jazz record, to me, is just perfect. And the fact that we got to press that in our darkest days, <laughs> that, that, that was a sign, right? And I like music in all formats, and I, I stream music, and I, I, I you know, listen to CDs and all that, but can have a, a, a beautiful piece of cover art, and you have liner notes, and, and you can drop a needle in a groove and hear music really come to life and hear the depth and, and kind of the, the, the story within the music. It, it just, it's the ultimate way to consume music. And, and it leaves an impression on you that's different than if you just listen to the same music on your phone. If you remember it, it stays with you in a deeper way. You know, you used to have these amazing music writers and you'd look forward to reading the liner notes because like they would have insight to the record, could oftentimes give you like a starting point to listen to the record, you know, give you an idea of like how to approach it and stuff. For me, I really like being in the presence of seeing, the, you know, the needle, you know, dance on the grooves. And there's something that happens to be able to have this very physical act occurring simultaneously with this real magic of hearing recorded sound. When Edison came up with the, the wax cylinder, the precursor of, of vinyl, he was really amazed by this discovery. And he knew right away that what he had come up with was gonna be something really vital for the, for the world. And that same technology that uh, Edison figures out in some time in the latter third of the 19th century, it's the very same thing we're doing now. It hasn't changed. Undoubtedly, there are challenges if it facing the music industry today. At the same time, labels, artists, everybody recognizes that physical product, and in particular vinyl, has an important place in, in its economic ecosystem too. They are embracing it and, and consumers continue to embrace it. Vinyl continues to grow. I think Nielsen just released its, its third quarter report this morning and, and you know, vinyl is the only physical category that, that showed growth and it continues to do that. We believe the future for United is bright. And we think we're doing the right things. The investments we're making and the way that we're approaching our craft here is somewhat unique in this industry. We're trying to bring and marry a, a desire to invest, a sophistication in terms of how we, we look at our business, manage our business, how we invest in our people and our processes and our systems to, to be a best practices manufacturer at the same time to continue to celebrate our heritage and our history. There aren't many companies that can say we, we've been doing something since 1949. We want to be the preeminent pressing partner to our partners, to our customers. We want to make great records.
When I was growing up, I'd spend two weeks in the woods with my dog. Sleep up in trees and whatnot. You know, it wasn't comfortable, it wasn't nice, but it, it kept my senses alive. I could, you know, hear the birds, I could, you know, sense the owls, I could sense things. I challenge myself daily to like do something I'm uncomfortable with. Continues your growth, and as an artist, you don't get so numb. The idea is to kind of bring them back, you know, and to be in tune with nature. That's why I do the horse thing. That's why I do the surf things. That connection is amazing. Jeff is the most real, proper American gentleman you could know. He's doing his own thing, and it's and he's having success with it, and it's great, and you can tell he's happy. When he comes to us and, and makes these artistic presentations of his clothing lines, he brings a band. He tells a story, the band plays great music. To hear that Jeff is really looking carefully at not only the materials that he's using, but the dyes that he's using, even growing some of his own dyes. That I was really thrilled to hear, and I think is a model for other people in the industry. I forgot about a dress I was gonna make, actually. Yeah. I left the pattern here, so when I was in LA, I couldn't do it. As a young kid, I used to steal my Barbie sketch pad and like go in and stamp, you know, little skirts and draw on them and that kind of stuff. And uh, obviously, being a Southern boy, it wasn't the uh, you know coolest thing, so I did it behind closed doors. Yeah, I'm gonna trim off the bottom hemline. Some lace. did all the sports and everything, and then I eventually started taking park clothes. My grandma, grandmother taught me how to sew and kind of, you know, moved on from there. And the actual dresses themselves come in visions. It's usually like the last ninth hour, but the best ones come at the end, I think. My grandfather worked at the Oak Ridge factory in Tennessee. Um, the Manhattan Project, he was the lead scientist. Brilliant guy, I used to grow up in his basement just making radios and we made, I made my own go-kart go out of wood and built the engine and like, you know, just grew up that way. So I gotta figure out the fabrication for this last dress. So I'm gonna have to actually piece it together, which is interesting. So it's all engineering, so you got like, you know, for example, you got a piece here, and then you got this piece here, and then you got this piece here. So I, essentially, I could do different fabrics. And then the sleeve piece here, but it's a half sleeve, so I could do another half sleeve, another piece. So basically, I'll use all my leftover fabric for this last dress. I come from Tennessee originally, and 
raised in the countryside with horses and nature. And I literally jumped in my Jeep one day and drove out here to Malibu. My only family friend out here, her mom was administrative counselor at Pepperdine. So she got me in on a half a scholarship. The other half, I, I lifeguarded. I worked for the Dean of Students. It's just interesting. I, I remember Jeff as an organization communication major. He studied in Florence, Italy. And, and all that time, you could see that his creative abilities were being honed and shaped. And I started being a creative director of Stiletto Entertainment. Met Barry Mellon's manager, who, his name's Gary Keefe, who hired me on the spot. And traveling the world with Barry and other artists to set up their tours, creative direction, graphic art, all that stuff. So I was able to do my art through that, the design, merchandising, some stage clothing. After that ride with Barry, I was like, okay, I've learned enough. Yeah, I was always determined to come back to Tennessee to bring back this craft, this art I've learned. Obviously, my heart's in Tennessee because that's where I was raised, and the land and everything. A little bit of him in there. You guys get it? Yeah. yeah. We good. You're good. Good? Yeah. Jeff is organic, he's real, he's from the earth. If it's creating clothing, it's all from the earth, using the earth with respect for the earth, and, and it's beautiful to look at. It's the same with his relationship with the ocean. He's a surfer. It's the same with his uh, animals, the way he works with horses. I mean, they just feel each other, and it's a, a mutual respect. Everyone's like, well, when do you start sustainable fashion? I'm like, what do you mean? I, that, that's how it began. Like, there was no starting because why would I do something that would destroy the environment I grew up in, in the woods and with animals? Hemp takes dyes much better than a cotton. You see, this is a cotton there. That's a hemp silk. So you can see it's lighter, so that means it doesn't take as well. Mm -hmm. So the cottons always take less. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's the same time, same dye solution, you know, that kind of thing. But if you go in the dye houses or you go in the printing shops, I mean, it's gnarly chemicals and they're all hopefully wearing masks, but sometimes not. Imagine cutting these synthetic fabrics and you cut every day and these finite particles get loose, right? And they basically breathe them in if you don't wear a mask. So originally my first sample maker, she got sick. So after time that build up, you know, obviously caused her lung damage. So I saw that firsthand and I was like, why is she sick? You know, she works in this environment. And then, I, you know, I figured it out. My mom had breast cancer. And so that got me thinking about intimates. So it's like, wow, these are the closest things we put on our bodies. Why isn't anybody considering this? Then I had a child who developed um, a heart condition um, because her, you know, her grandfather ran a, you know, basically uh, dumped the chemicals onto the crops, crop duster, right, next door. And I spent a year going every day to the hospital. So these things that aren't natural that we create, we have responsibilities to further into studying and how is this gonna affect us. It's all about how quickly can we get to market, how fast can we sell it? How much can we sell it for? What else in this world are we not questioning? Are we not challenging? So it's either like, stop doing what I love, my passion, or figure out a different solution. I began doing the plant-based dyes and figuring that out because nobody was doing it. I spent time studying in Florence, Italy. So I learned kind of the art in there. Let's make it a little bit stronger. Now 
I'll do little, this is gonna be fun. So what I'm gonna do is mix these and then I'm gonna have to heat it up for the indigo. It'll take a minute. I think the goal is to give everyone the decision. Just like you would in your food. This is what's in your food. Well, this is what's in your bra. If you want to wear it, sweat in it, go to yoga in it, wear it to bed, whatever, it's your choice. So, even like using silver, I use silver spoons. I don't use, um, that affects it. Even if the pots are stainless steel or copper, those metals, it all is, all is gonna affect it. And that's why I use glass for the mixing. Glass won't affect it. You know, your first challenge, obviously, when you're doing something sustainable, you have less um, choices. So in fabrications, obviously, your dyes, vats, you have to, like, harvest your flowers. You can also source them from other farmers. I mean, there's more details to it than, like I said, just going to a dye house, picking a number, and in an hour, the dye vat spits it out. So, this is the, I don't know what you call it, the concentrate. So then I'll mix it in just with the water and the vinegar and the crock pot all heated and that will give me kind of more of a, the dye water vat that I use to actually dye something. All these fizzes. It's like those volcanoes you did as a kid. Kind of fake lava flow. Yeah, this color tone's great. You see, you can see the color in there. The lace died out really well. You see, I didn't strain the indigo and the logwood. So where it touches the fabric, I mean, I can use it to draw, it would become more purple. So when I wash it out, it'll get more even tone. I could strain it. You know, like here, get out all the logwood of the dye. I kept it in there as a concentrate to make it stronger. But typically, I would strain it, create the dye vat with just the water, not the logwood inside of it, so it doesn't touch the fabric, and then it'd be consistent throughout. But this way, I'm letting it kind of touch it and add some variations. That's part of the creative process. And I could imagine not doing my own dyes now, because then, like, that's fun, part of the creation. Well, the next collection is obviously the one we're working on now called Atlantis. And simply, I'm working with Madeira and Portugal, and they have this beautiful arts craftsmanship of creating this lace, probably 16 hands on one piece of fabric, one piece of embroidery. And it's such a lost art. So we're using that on the new collection to kind of bring awareness and show, hey, there's a different use for this, this craftsmanship. And Hopefully you keep it alive. So this is, uh, so the main <clears throat> feature of this one, which I think, yeah, I'm just go underneath, is gonna be the, um, you can definitely see the Madeira lace there. So that's a completed embroidered piece. So they hand do each so. We have a very close um, relation with the Madeira embroidery. It's fascinating to know that someone from the States is actually working with an aspect from Portuguese culture and incorporating it in his designs. I'm very curious to, to see what the result was. One of the dresses he pulled up and he held it to me and he said, this was a tablecloth that I found. be able to take sort of a new design thoughts from America with an old, you know, culture and product and put that together to come out with something so beautiful is great. I, I don't know how you put innovation better than that. I imagine that the people in Madeira will be very honored to see one of their most traditional features in the island to be recognized abroad and to be modernized. It used to be that craftsmanship was linked to traditional businesses and old kind of stuff. And now, more and more, very creative artists and people 
are this rediscovering it and transforming it for the new era that we are living now. So that's very positive, and we encourage that, of course. There has to be something, whether it's financial, economic, literally just a, a push forward and a motivation to keep that product and keep younger people recreating and not letting it die off. It's just amazingly important. It's artistic. If you think, you know, it's like painting or it's like a sculpture. By doing that, it's not mechanical. Uh, and it has all this a, a, a traditional background underlying to these activities. It's like in that air. Okay, perfect. And relax. Here we are. Uh, and step one leg forward. All right, I think I can go. Actually, do this. Go ahead and just walk towards me. See it flow. All right, and do it back and then come at me one more time. I know it's a short runway, but just kind of like fake it, like step hard. Yep. Cool. Just trying to see. I think I want to take it up. It's hard work to show you what you've created in 20 minutes, and then it's done. You know, it's kind of like, oh, wow, that was a lot of work for like such a short show, you know. And I get jealous of these musicians that can like tour an album for a year, and then I have to change in three months. I got to do something bigger and better. It's like, okay, great. Yeah, I'm gonna have a heart attack soon, very soon. Spends time steaming. Yeah. It's a, it just kind of forms the garments. But there's... Especially with natural fibers. Minha família é toda estava envolvida em todo o processo. Eu sei tudo sobre as linhas, sobre o tecido, sobre o bordado. É... O, todo o processo também que as bordadeiras têm para, para começar e terminar o, o bordado. E isso para mim é importante, de, dessa, desta forma estou a, a concluir um processo que é a promoção, a promoção do bordado. Uh, people are going to be crowded on each side. You won't be able to move there. You have to stay on the red brick road the whole time. Or the only other pocket is this. Slow down a little bit. Yeah. And then here, you could do this like thing. You could do a little turn here and, yeah. It's still slow. And you could do it there too. And it's so interesting, you know, being a country that is new, exciting, and fascinated with European history. We feel this urge and eagerness and curiosity towards the, um, the historical aspects of Europe. So there's this, you know, cultural changing that is like wanting to happen. And I think it materializes through exchanges like these. It's a symbol. And what we are celebrating here is how talent can team up and produce things that are amazing. I think one of the things I admire most about him is that he is a whole person, and he is authentically himself at all times. And I think you see that in his designs, and you hear that in his speech. He finds more in me, and I think he finds more in himself, and I think that's why he's successful, 
in such a challenging world, he doesn't let the roadblocks in such a destructive world stop him from doing the right thing the right way and creating beauty from it. You know, if everyone's kind of retreating in the sustainability area and they're kind of allowing this greenwashing to take place and that's good enough and nobody's really saying, hey, no, there's more we can do, more than just picking one area, like let's do the whole gamut. That will encourage the up and coming students that are learning, the up and coming designers, like, hey, we gotta keep this moving forward. So that's why I feel like I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, that's why I can't really rest. And so I'm willing to do whatever, sell the farm and, you know, keep everything moving forward because it's not about me or what I have, what I gain. It's so I'll keep doing this until it really does, you know, turn. I think all of us here are perfectionists. It's kind of a trap. But it's also the only way I know how to live. And I know per perfection is not attainable, but you always try to get there. You're always trying to do it better. To do it right. People have all kind of things that they've said about Memphis, but these are the realities. The core part of music for this country, which has impacted the world, came right out of this immediate area. When you consider the foundation of what blues music was and the, and, and the fact that individuals who were so important to the establishing of that credibility came to Memphis in order to launch that with young cats like Elvis Presley, who became the defining sound of what American rock and roll was. And when you consider the soulfulness that came out of Stax Records and High Records, we are the defining symbol of what music credibility is for this country. It's gotta be just the feeling and the, the nature and the, the land of Tennessee. There's something alive in, in nature there. I am a proud Memphian. I like the people here. There's a sort of attitude of people from Memphis is that there's nothing you can do to us. You can't beat us down. I've lived elsewhere briefly for periods of short years. I always seem to come back. It's the rubber band effect of Memphis. Everyone who moves comes back. Born and raised in Memphis, I lived in every part of town. I love Memphis, I, I would never leave. People that leave always come back. My father owned a music store. When I was in fourth grade, I had gotten in trouble and I got taken to the office and the teacher said, what do you think you're gonna do? I'm going to work in my father's music store. 
and I was serious. Everything was always going to work in Dad's shop. And I tried to play guitar. I tried a lot. I just no good at it. I used to fix them at my father's shop. I used to build them out of spare parts when I was 13. That's why I never left. What better place to make and sell guitars than the birthplace of rock and roll? The only thing better is, you know, you print money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the only better job. It's in me. I can't get it. I can't stop it. I have to sell instruments, and preferably guitars. I was born in Kansas. When I was 12, my father was transferred to Memphis. I was already into music and guitars, particularly before I came here. I tried everything, you know, sax, uh, piano, <laughs> uh, pedal steel, you know, you name it. I had tr uh, tried it all, but guitar was the thing. It was in the mid-60s. I got with a band. Because there weren't very many legitimate bands around, we uh, got a lot of high-paying jobs from uh, college proms and the people that had a lot of money to spend on bands, you know, but there weren't very many bands. I made a bunch of money in a very short amount of time in, in the mid-60s, relatively speaking. I was in high school still driving a Corvette, you know. I knew that it was not gonna last. I started noticing bands were, and they were, they were pretty darn good. I got intrigued out of boredom on some of these tours, taking guitars apart and putting them back together again while we were traveling. Now, the ash, the mahogany, we also use alder. And then we use maple for the necks. And I'll buy, I source all that local, local woodshop. Um, it's, I'm, those, I'm trying to buy big boards, shipping not an option. The wood is cheap enough that if you can buy it local and sh just carry it yourself, you're way better off. Because most of this will only cost less than $10 a foot. My aha moment for me was when I was watching, uh, it may sound silly, but it was hot for teacher. Watching Eddie Van Halen play that guitar, walking out of the table, doing that solo, it's like, I want to play guitar. I just got into it, got into it, and then started building on my own guitars when I was like 13 or 14. But how I got started was I would I would mod them. You know, it's like, do I really need the tone knob? No, take it out. Do I, do I want, do I like these pickups? No, let me put new pickups in. It's like, do I like this neck? No. Do I like this? No, let's do this, this, this. Like, let's try this. It's like, okay, let's do this. And then eventually you realize that you're, you're stripping guitars apart. You're basically building them up from scratch. I guess when I was 14 or 15, my dad bought me my first real guitar. And it was an off-brand, you know, cheap beginner package with a guitar and an amp, and it was all about 150 bucks or something. And so I started playing on that, and quickly, as I gained skill, I realized that this thing was totally inadequate. That's when I started doing the repair and tinkering with them, too. I, I took it apart and put it back together, tried to figure out how to make it work better. I played all sorts of guitars and got to learn about the woods, got to learn how they built them. Uh, would go and visit distributors and go to trade shows and, and actually, you know, how are you building this? What are you, you know, what techniques? And watching it change, watching the tools change um, and some of the mindsets and kind of learning why there are certain things that everybody does. The bodies are actually made out of multiple pieces of wood that have to be glued together to make what we call a blank. And the blank is what you cut out. And depending on what I put together, basically I create the personality of the guitar, but not its individual traits. In other words, by putting different electronics in, we can modify the sound, but the basic general overall sound is created from this. Like this is mahogany with redwood. 
And so it's gonna be more of a mellower sound. Whereas if I use like ash or maple, it'll be much brighter. If I use a rosewood, it's gonna be much bassier. And I learned some of those little tricks that they did to lower the price of their guitars without changing much. Big thing was automation, a lot of automation. Everything over there is automated, not hand done. So I kind of take all that knowledge when I come here. We need to outsource some stuff. We've got to be more hands on and we can do that with machining and then don't machine it to the end point, do the handwork like y'all have been doing. This center line right there, yeah. I want it to match this center line so that when you look at the edge, that's just one line. And it's all, it, it, I never get it dead on perfect, but I get pretty close. I mean, it's all done by hands and the board slips a little bit. See that little center line right there on the top? And then there's a center line on the bottom. And you try to match those up. And I'm pretty close. I'm off a little bit some sort of thousandths of an inch. Not bad for doing it by eye. And myself and a friend who was one of the few really good guitar players in town, and his father had quite a bit of money. He put his son in business uh, with a music store. We were both of the same mind that just because a guitar came out of a factory, you know, it didn't mean that it was right. So we started doing things to him. We started establishing a bit of a reputation for that. Jimmy Page came in and was just absolutely knocked out by the, these factory guitars that we had customized. And he said, this, nobody else is doing this. And we said, well, surely it's being done in California. Everything's done in California first, isn't it? He goes, no. He said, you know, I've, I've been around uh, the world now uh, this is the first place I've seen like this. We developed a relationship with, with Jimmy. I always knew TK. I'm a Memphian. I, I, of course, I knew who TK was. TK was friends with Larry, the guy that taught me. There was a small group that formed all of it, and they all knew each other. I remember St. Blue's getting started and, you know, the whole thing snowballing and getting cool and making the guitars for all famous people. And he was already real famous for Paragon. Gear needs work. He's, he was at the shop that was right downtown, right five minutes away from wherever they were playing. Needed some work. TK was going to be the guy that fixed it. I mean, after all, he fixed Jimmy Page's stuff. He has good credentials. But like I said, what changed really was when he went to Schechter, he came back knowing how to build a guitar, really build a guitar, what it took. I would say that was be the entire reason why St. Blue succeeded. That's wrong direction. Holes have to face that way. Lining up the template so that it, when it gets on the machine, it's in the correct orientation. If he had not had that knowledge and was just strictly just a repair guy putting guitars together, it would not have had the impact. I started at St. Blues in 1984 when I came back from working in California for Schechter. And we lasted the first time around until 1989. We were out of business. And the trademark was intact with the, with the, with the two gentlemen that, that had put the money up for the original uh, St. Blues. It was dormant for a long time. Uh, then in 2006, a, uh, a venture capitalist, um, not a player, not a musician, unfortunately. Uh, and so he bought the trademark, decided he was going to make St. Blue's guitars. Within a few years, he basically made just about every mistake he could possibly make. <laughs> if I can be successful in the cell telephone business, then why, of course I can be successful in the guitar business. You know, that's not true. Uh, and he found out the hard way. 
<laughs> the real hard way. And so a while back, he uh, he finally ran out of money, you know, or, you know uh, we, we was not going to put any more money in it, and he he made a deal, if you will, with uh, the guys that were left, the actual craftsmen, the people he should have been listening to in the first place. I'll check just to make sure that this thing will close when they're all in. They should be just fine. Now I'm just going to glue it in and clamp it, and that's it. Special high-tech tool used to spread glue with. music store with Robert and his dad owned the store and his dad was kind of getting tired of the whole music business because he didn't like the internet. He didn't, he didn't like the way it was going. He didn't like the big box stores. It was getting unpersonal. You know, it was more of, you know, what do you want? Here, take it, go. And so the small shop is, was slowly dying and he's like, he saw it and it's just like, I just, I just gotta get out. And so he, he basically was gonna retire. So I came in in April, a little trial run for about two or three days. And I'm like, well, that was fun. All right, I guess I'll figure out what I'm going to do. And about a month later, they called me, said, can you come down one more time? And it came down, it was like, all right, cool, this works. You're doing it the way I want you to do it. It's like, OK, can you, can you start, like, tomorrow? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. It used to be like everybody. You'd have parts built, and you would assemble them. And the parts could be either made here or overseas. Now we're really something different, because we're in control of all the details. We had two choices. We could either shut down the whole line or we can start making them here and just change our whole dynamic. So that's what we did. We started in, I think, September of 2010 looking to make them here. Shaping the nut, which is this little part that's going to go right in here, that the strings will go over the top. And in August of 2011, after we remodeled this whole building, we opened back up as strictly made, strictly made here in the U.S. And that's the way we've been doing it ever since. I have personally built a little over 300 of the guitars that we've shipped out of here. No, a lot of guys are using preformed stuff because it makes it a lot easier, but I don't like the sound of it. Bone's got a nice transference to it, so that's why I use it. I can tell you, as somebody who knows how guitars are built, this one's built better. There are all sorts of little details throughout the whole instrument that make a better and superior instrument. The trick as the manufacturer is can you make it twice and can you make it for the right price? I noticed that our industry was very retrospective. We're very caught up in those great times of guitar rock and roll. Once we put an amp in and put a pickup in, development of guitar really kind of slowed down. I mean, for 50 years, it's changing every five years. New shapes, new models, new electronics, new, new, new. And then it just stops. My whole thing was, there's got to be a way of making an American-made product at a reasonable price. I just can't believe we cannot build an American-made guitar for less than $4,000. I just don't believe it. Mostly what I do is raw necks, and I'll sand them, shape them, polish them, finish them, put the frets on, and then finish out those frets and get a neck that, that I would be willing to take home and play myself. If it passes my test, then it should be good enough for anybody. We don't build or try to sell anything that we wouldn't have for our own personal instrument. 
sometimes may spend a little too much time on a certain element of what we're doing, you know, relative to the cost benefit analysis. Out of those 300, they're all 300 individual guitars because they all have their own unique personality. And that's what I love about it. The fact that you're getting a guitar that only like three or four people have touched. So how do you want your guitar set up? What do you want it to do? What do you, you, know, you tell me. And people love that. We want our guitars in people's hands. We don't build these things because we love them forever and we want to hold on to them forever. We want to sell them and we want people playing them. The social media has really done its job as far as educating uh, people that are not pros. You, you will learn faster. Um, you will enjoy playing it more. Uh, it'll tune up more accurately. All these things, if you have it detailed by a competent technician. I think the future's bright. I hope it is. Just keep doing what we're doing and not try to change things or shake things up just for the sake of change. We don't ever want to get into a production situation where we're making too many guitars and you know, sending substandard things out the door. Quality is everything in this kind of business, in this kind of world, and your customers, they remember everything. I know people are watching. I, I know people are watching and paying attention. I see stuff all the time, I'm like, everybody knows what you have, why would you change who you are to try to get another four sales? If you make a great product, and you make it the way you make it and don't try to fit in everywhere else, people will buy your product because it's not like everybody else. We ship several dozens of cigar boxes every few months to Germany to a distributor called Toman over there, and they distribute for all of Europe. And I wonder who's playing them over there. Is it a kid? Is it is it an adult that's already been playing? You know, is this going to get someone started down this path? And is it going to give them happiness? Is it going to make their life better in some way? I, I sure hope it does. As far as legacy, I don't know if I'll be in any history books or anything, and that's fine by me. The Simple Binds guy has fun with my guitar for the next 10 years and is playing small clubs, and his wife is happy, and everybody, that's great. Fantastic. That, that would be perfect. That would be the legacy. kind of hearing for the long haul until, you know, until my key doesn't fit the door anymore, I'm, I'm walking in. And when it stops fitting the door, that's when I start building them in my backyard. This brand is not gonna die, not on my watch. That's the way the three of us feel, so.